Hello again. Uh, welcome to AWS um, event for startups and developers. We're very excited to be back in New York City. We were just here last year in June. Uh, my name is Rodika. I actually handle startup and developer marketing for AWS. If you follow AWS startups, uh, I typically man that account. So please follow it. There's a lot of uh, really cool, interesting developer information there. Um, and just to cut to the chase, we want to be really mindful of your time today. Um, the kind of speaker lineup that we have for today is really around you know, the, the fact that you guys are building uh, web and mobile apps, and we want to teach you and show you how to really leverage AWS products for those apps. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Matt Wood, our technology uh, evangelist, who's going to be walking you through an uh, introduction to AWS and show you how to use uh, our products for a mo uh, web app. Matt? Thank you very much. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much. So hello, everybody. My name is Matt Wood. I am the technology evangelist uh, for Amazon Web Services. Uh, that basically means that I get to come to uh, events such as this and talk to smart people such as yourselves about uh, cloud computing in general, answer any questions that you have, and uh, answer any questions you have about Amazon's cloud platform specifically. Um, this always gets left to the end. Uh, so I just want to uh, echo Radhika. And thank you all very much uh, for joining us here today. It's a real privilege uh, to have you here. I appreciate you're all busy people, and you've taken time to, to join us today. And it's, a, as I say, a real privilege to talk through uh, some of the things we're doing uh, at Amazon uh, in the cloud computing space. Um, so I guess you're all here. Uh, this is a, a, an event focused towards uh, developers uh, building applications. And we see uh, customers uh, of all shapes and sizes building our applications uh, on the Amazon cloud. We have uh, hundreds of thousands of customers now across 190 countries, uh, which, as I remember, is pretty much all of them. And they're all building out applications. Uh, so whether that is applications, uh, which one on the web, uh, standard web applications, social networks, uh, multiplayer, online games, casual games, you name it, uh, through to uh, mobile applications delivered to iOS devices, to Android devices, and uh, building out uh, deep uh, deep experiences on mobile, mobile applications with uh, the sort of flexible, uh, elastic back end uh, that, we're, that we're sort of well known for. Uh, we're seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of adoption uh, in enterprise customers, so people building out business line of sight applications, building out uh, deep uh, analytics around our platform, and uh, just out of left field, we're also seeing some adoption on Mars. Uh, so this is one of my all-time favorite use cases from our friends uh, at uh, NASA. This is the NASA uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, NASA JPL. And uh, they are running uh, this little guy. Uh, this is one of the, uh, one of the Mars rovers. Uh, it's currently pootling around on the, on the surface of Mars uh, right now. And uh, the bit that uh, talks to AWS uh, is up there in the top bit, in the Wall-E sort of eyes. So these guys have uh, two high-resolution uh, 3D cameras. And uh, basically, they're continually panning the surface of Mars, uh, the red planet, uh, and pulling in information. And the guys at NASA, the tactical command back at NASA, use these images and the telemetry from the, from the instrument, from the, uh, from the rover, uh, to basically guide uh, the little guy around Mars. Uh, so they pull in those uh, high-resolution images. Uh, they run them through a workflow, running on Amazon Simple Workflow. And they build out uh, an image which looks a bit like this. So this is tiled, generated uh, on, on the Amazon cloud. This is a two-gigapixel image, uh, which is used for tactical, tactical direction of these little Mars rovers. So you can see the rover itself down in the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, if we pan across uh, this massive uh, gigapixel image, you can see the little tracks, and you can see the other solar panels on the other side. And the guys back at NASA here on Earth basically get to click uh, where they want the Mars rover to go, and they can take in the full 3D space of Mars, navigate around rocks, and uh, if they see anything interesting, uh, Martians or anything, they can go off uh, and uh, investigate them. So this pretty much is, uh, is as, as broad as you can get. And when we started working on Amazon Web Services uh, about six years ago, actually it was our sixth uh, anniversary uh, of the launch of S3 uh, last month, uh, we very much thought that the uh, advantages of utility computing, so the elasticity, the removal of capital investment to be able to build applications, sophisticated applications at any scale, would really be uh, of particular interest to startups uh, who, were, who were resource constrained. But what we've seen over time is this remarkable diversity of applications across web, across the mobile space, across business line of sight applications, uh, disaster recovery, data analytics, all the way up into the celestial bodies uh, running on Mars. So across all of these use cases, we've really seen a, a trend, uh, an uptick in people building out uh, you know, what you could consider sophisticated applications. These are applications which are designed to take advantage of some of the common elasticity found in cloud computing. Um, so by sophisticated, I guess I'm really talking about applications that can scale. 
So applications that can quickly respond and scale up when you have an increased demand for resources and uh, conversely can scale down when that demand starts to fall away. Applications which are automated, uh, so you can quickly deploy development and test environments, integration tests, and move into an automated production environment, which again, bends and flex based on your demand. We're seeing applications that are becoming price aware, that are taking advantage of some of the different pricing options that we've got, using on-demand instances when it makes sense, but falling back to work with our spot instances, uh, where you basically get to set the price of the compute that you want to use yourself. So choosing and using uh, price and cost as a driver for their architecture in the same way that uh, you might consider demand a driver for, the, for your architecture. And also uh, flexible applications. So applications which are agile and can respond quickly to the sort of business opportunities that present themselves. And uh, I guess if, if low cost and the removal of this sort of initial capital spend is the sizzle, uh, the stake that ke keeps people coming back really at any, si at any size and any scope is this flexibility, this increased agility that our customers see when they're working uh, in cloud environments. So this is really what I, I define as, as a sophisticated application, an application which can take advantage of these sort of utility computing mechanics. And the real goal, you know, uh, is, uh, is, is to be more productive. Uh, so, you know, you can define the cloud in a number of different ways. But for me, the cloud is a collection of really productivity tools uh, for uh, tightly constrained domains. And that really falls into engineering and into startups particularly. So the goal of our services is to help our customers become more productive, to move to market more quickly, to remove the sort of undifferentiated heavy lifting that's commonly associated uh, with infrastructure provisioning. And really to allow our customers to focus back in on their core competency, rather than having to worry about um, provisioning and, and the, uh, the, the management and the maintenance of infrastructure at pretty much any scale. And this focus is really important. So if you consider the sort of typical application life cycle, uh, you might have uh, an initial idea, and we don't have a service for that yet. Uh, you have to come up with that uh, uh, yourselves at the moment. But then you move in and you start to develop your application. Uh, you start to move through the release phase to get it out to your customers. Uh, and then you typically uh, evaluate some of the data that your application is generating and use some of that information, use some of those metrics uh, to uh, iterate on your product idea, or if it's not working out, to pivot and take some of your technology and apply it to a different domain. So this is the typical sort of uh, approach that customers take in the development lifecycle. Very common in startups, particularly startups that are following the sort of uh, lean methodology uh, from Eric Ries's book. So the great thing about this uh, life cycle is that the faster you can run from development through release, through evaluation, through to the point where you want to iterate or pivot, uh, the better. This allows you to address customer needs much more quickly. It allows you to uh, address new business opportunities as and when they arise. Uh, the problem is that in traditionally provisioned infrastructure, um, uh, infrastructure can act as, a, as, as friction for this process. So IT is, uh, uh, is supposed to enable uh, innovation. Uh, but what we typically see in uh, statically provisioned, traditionally provisioned infrastructure is that it actually acts to slow this cycle down. It takes a long time to provision new hardware. You have to go and fix it when it breaks and all these sort of things. And any of that just takes your focus away from where it should be, which is back on your customers. So what we hope is that with, this, um, with these flexible utility computing uh, building blocks that we offer at Amazon is that we really want to help customers accelerate this cycle to move through development more quickly, to uh, support a more successful release, to allow you to be able to evaluate the data that your application is generating, and to be able to iterate and pivot to really address your own customers' needs. So this means you can move to your minimum viable product more quickly uh, when you're getting up and running. It also means that you're faster to production and faster to your market, and uh, you can move very, very smoothly from a development and test environment on the cloud into a production environment. It also means, as I say, it's also faster to pivot. So if something isn't working out, you can simply spin down the infrastructure that you no longer need and try out uh, another idea which may have different infrastructure requirements. There's no risk to taking these infrastructure building blocks and using them, because if you don't need them anymore, you can just decommission them and you stop paying for them. It's a utility model. So with all that said, uh, really by way of introduction, uh, for people that may not be familiar with some of the benefits of working on the Amazon cloud, there's really three things that I wanted to talk, uh, talk today in, in this session. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about application architecture and give you some insight into um, uh, how some of our customers are utilizing this utility model uh, to build out highly available, flexible, scalable applications. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of our newer services uh, that enable you to build out these sophisticated services, which are 
remain flexible, uh, but are a much more productive way of working. And then we'll touch on at the end uh, something that uh, uh, a lot of people are interested in, uh, which is how we go about securing this and our customers' role in securing applications in the cloud. So, so let's get started. Um, this is a developer event, and so there will be code up on stage. Uh, I'm going to be doing some, some live demos, uh, so fingers crossed. Uh, the demo overlords are smiling upon me today. Uh, but this is going to be a technical session, uh, so uh, fair warning there. So what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to uh, use this opportunity uh, to build out a uh, production a web application uh, live in front of you. And like all good ideas, uh, this one started uh, on the back of a, a back of a napkin. Uh, this is me scribbling down some ideas for this event when we were planning it out uh, for a web application which allows customers to share the things that they love. Uh, so it basically allows customers to upload photos and share them, tag them, and all the rest of it. So this was drawn uh, on the back of uh, a back of a, uh, a napkin on an American Airlines flight uh, over to the US. And this is what the application turned into. So this is the application running live on uh, the AWS cloud. It's called Likeability. And as I say, it allows customers to share the things that they love, to share the things that they're passionate about, photograph what they're, 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 they're interested in, upload them, and share them with their friends. So when I was thinking about this, uh, we sort of got together and we did a brainstorm. And I'm sure all of you, particularly in startups, have, have done something similar where you get around your whiteboard and really throw some ideas together. And uh, we wanted the sort of key feature to be uh, a service which allowed customers to share and tag images, right? So nice and straightforward. And some of the additional application features that we wanted to support was that we wanted customers to be able to browse by tag. Uh, we wanted customers to be able to like images so we can get an idea of uh, what the most popular images and the most popular things are up on the, on the service. We wanted, obviously, customers to be able to view the images, right? Uh, we wanted to be able to collect some basic statistics. Uh, so we wanted to be able to collect the most views or the most viewed item. And uh, for those people that are clicking our little uh, heart or like button, uh, we wanted to be able to collect up what the most popular likes were. And we wanted to add in some search, and we wanted to be able to support this across both web and mobile applications. So this was our sort of application definition, uh, just on a whiteboard. Uh, but we also had some sort of operational concerns. So how did we want to implement this? What was important to us in terms of delivering this service operationally? Well, obviously, we wanted it to be as available as possible. We wanted it to be always up. We wanted it to be scalable. Uh, so when we hit the front page of Hacker News, uh, we had enough capacity or that our architecture could increase when we had a sudden influx of uh, new customers. We wanted the thing to be fast uh, so uh, it could uh, respond quickly. Uh, customers love fast web, app web applications. And we wanted it to be low cost. So we wanted to be able to use some of the, uh, as I say, the, the cost optimization approaches that our com customers commonly use in order to be able to support the scale, but also to be able to control costs uh, when we get started. So with that in mind, uh, this is the application architecture that we came up with. And this very much represents the sort of best practices uh, that we see in deploying applications uh, both uh, in, inside Amazon and some of our customers uh, uh, use in deploying their own applications. Uh, so here's our application architecture, uh, a blueprint, if you will, for what we're going to build out. Uh, we're going to build out a sort of typical uh, three-tier web application. Uh, we're going to have uh, a data store, and for that, we're going to use uh, Amazon DynamoDB. I'll talk in detail about Amazon DynamoDB, but if you're not familiar with it, it's a, a, a managed NoSQL database service. We're going to use uh, Amazon EC2, the Elastic Compute Cloud, for our application service. Uh, they're going to sit in the application tier. And in front of that, to control the load and the flow into these, uh, into these uh, load balancers, into these uh, application servers, sorry, uh, we're going to use uh, the Elastic Load Balancing Service, or, or ELB. So that's our typical three-tier web application. Uh, let's take a look at how we're going to provision that. Now, fingers crossed, ladies and gentlemen, I am going to try and do this live. Uh, so I have backup videos if this doesn't work, uh, but uh, um, here we go. Okay, 500 people in the room, no pressure. So this is the Amazon Web Management Console, if you've not seen it before. Uh, we have our services across the top, everything from Elastic Beanstalk, uh, which we'll hear more about uh, from my colleague Paul uh, in the second session. Uh, things like S3, the simple storage service. We've got EC2, uh, the virtual private cloud, on and on and on. And uh, our rate of innovation is so high uh, that we're actually starting to run off the top of our, uh, of, our, of our bar here. So we have some of our services that don't quite fit on uh, drop down here. So I'm going to take a look at DynamoDB. Uh, Amazon DynamoDB is, a, as I say, a NoSQL managed database service. It's very, very easy to use. And I want to give you a sense of just how easy and quick it is to provision a database which can uh, really operate at high scale and is highly available. So uh, I have a couple of, uh, of DynamoDB tables that we're going to use to store data in already provisioned. Uh, but I want to provision the, uh, the, the new one here for you uh, live. So all we have to do is we have to click on Create Table. 
uh, we give the table uh, a quick name, uh, so I'm gonna call it items. And then, uh, because this is a NoSQL data store, we don't have to provide any schema or any additional information uh, to the database. Uh, the only thing that we do have to provide is the primary key for the data. So this is the mechanism that we're gonna use to retrieve data from our database. Uh, so we support a number of different uh, primary keys, uh, both uh, hash keys and hash and range keys. And I'll talk about those in a minute, but for now I'm just gonna use a standard hash key. This is just a normal primary key uh, with a, a unique identifier. And um, we're gonna call that ID. I'm gonna click continue. The next thing I'm gonna do is provision the capacity that I'm gonna need. So uh, Amazon uh, DynamoDB has a provision throughput model. Uh, this allows you to basically reserve the amount of I.O. performance that your application needs uh, in uh, writes per, reads and writes per second. So I'm gonna set up that I need 50 reads and 50 writes per second. Uh, I'll talk more in detail about this in a minute, what it really means for your application. We're gonna set up uh, this provision throughput. Uh, when your application starts to reach the limits of your provision throughput, uh, we'll get a simple notification system alert, uh, which will be sent to us uh, by email. But you can also use this uh, to ping a programmatic service to automatically scale your DynamoDB provisioning. So we'll go ahead and click Create Table. And that is pretty much all you need to do. Uh, so now DynamoDB will, uh, will, as a service, will go off and provision the infrastructure that it needs uh, to support 50 reads and 50 writes per second. It'll do this on solid state disks uh, up on the, on the Amazon infrastructure. And that's pretty much all we have to do. So we don't have to worry about provisioning the instances or the storage underneath it. Uh, DynamoDB will take care of all of that for us. All we have to worry about is what does our data model look like? What information does our application want to put and get from DynamoDB? So it's a very productive way of getting started. The next thing I'm going to do is provision a full application web stack along our application architecture. Um, because Amazon uh, Web Services provides this collection of infrastructure building blocks, uh, we can uh, go ahead and provision EC2 instances and load balancers uh, by hand if we want to. But because this is a programmatic or a programmable platform, all of our infrastructure is basically available at the end of an API call. And this allows us to build out these sophisticated applications which can be automatic, uh, deployed automatically. For that, I'm gonna use a service called AWS CloudFormation. You can see the uh, DynamoDB table just provisioned. Uh, it's all ready for use now. Um, we're gonna go to the CloudFormation tab and we're gonna spin up the rest of the infrastructure in an automatic way. So I'm not gonna go ahead and provision these instances by hand. Instead, I've already defined what my application architecture looks like in a very simple JSON template. And I'm gonna go ahead and use that template to provision uh, the full stack, the full architecture. So I'm gonna jump to the CloudFormation tab here. I'm gonna click uh, Create New Stack. I'm gonna give it a name, so demo day one. Uh, and then I'm gonna provide the template URL. So I've stored the template up on Amazon S3. Uh, this is great for versioning and also great for sharing with other members of your team. It's great if you wanna spin up uh, a sand developer sandboxes or if you wanna provision uh, new services very, very quickly. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna read in uh, my application architecture. So these three tiers with the load balancer, uh, with the Elastic Compute Cloud application servers. We're gonna store uh, an, an S3 bucket to store the images that our, our, our users are gonna upload. But we also need to tell it which DynamoDB tables to use in the application. And then CloudFormation will not only provision the infrastructure, but it'll also go ahead and uh, configure our application, bootstrap our application so it can start to be used. So we've got a, a table for the items, which is the items table that I just created, and the other two that I had, I had pre-created. And I can specify a key name here if I want to log into the instances that are gonna be provisioned on our behalf. I click that I acknowledge that, click continue, and finally review my changes, click continue, and that's it. So now CloudFormation uh, will go ahead and provision the resources uh, that we want to. CloudFormation is a free service. Uh, you only pay for the resources that you provision. And it's got some really nice uh, tools and additional services built into it which allow you to manage your infrastructure or adjust your infrastructure uh, when it's in a running state. So that takes um, about three minutes to bake. So I'm gonna jump back to my slides and we'll come back to this when it's provisioned in a second. Uh, okay, uh, I had some videos lined up just in case we had connectivity issues. So I'm just gonna click through these uh, really quickly. Uh, so what did we just launch, right? So what we just launched uh, in just a couple of clicks, in just a couple of minutes, uh, was basically a full production stack. So this is a collection of infrastructure building blocks which have been provisioned, ready for production use. These are battle hardened and ready for use. So we followed cloud architecture best practices. We followed the, the rules and the, the experience that a lot of our customers have built up over the years in order to be able to uh, drive application architectures which are scalable, which are fault tolerant and which can uh, work in a low cost way. So uh, our, um, our CTO said this uh, many, many years ago, uh, Werner Vogel's uh, Amazon.com CTO. He basically said that with computer systems or infrastructure, everything fails all of the time. 
And this is one of the sort of guiding features of cloud architecture. The fact that we can't stop things failing in the cloud any more than you can stop uh, the hard drive in your laptop failing or, or connection failing to your house. What we can do is we can use the fact that we know that computer systems are brittle and you can have power failures and you can have CPU and drive failures and all the rest of it and use that to drive the definition of our architecture going forwards. So we're going to design for the fact that failure can occur. Uh, we can hope that it won't, uh, but eventually over a long enough time frame, uh, things will, might go wrong. But we can use that to drive our architecture, to drive it that if we expect failure to happen, we can recover quickly from that failure, we can deliver higher availability applications, and as a nice sweetener, the very same uh, application architecture practices I'm going to talk about are used to, de to uh, deliver a scalable architecture. So the first thing that we want to do is to start to think of our application uh, in terms of a collection of decoupled services. So uh, in static, static traditionally provisioned infrastructure, it's very common because you want to cut costs to overload your individual in, uh, servers, right? So the individual hardware that you're provisioning ends up being something to everyone. So on that, you'll run your database, your application servers, you might even run your load balancer on that. The problem here is obviously you've got one massive single point of failure. If anything happens to that one server, uh, then, uh, then your application will, will become unavailable. But in decoupling in this way, in starting to think in terms of these horizontal tiers, we have a load balancer, we have our application servers, and we have our data store beneath it, and any other asynchronous processes that you might have under the hood. You can start to decouple and remove these single points of failure. So we start to decouple our load balancer from our application servers and our data store into these horizontal tiers. The next thing that we want to do is we want to ensure that our application servers are effectively stateless. This means that each application server, each instance that we're going to run in our application tier, doesn't need to know too much about any of the other instances that are running there. They're not going to share too much, and we're not going to maintain the state on a single instance. If you do that, it's a bad idea, because should that instance fail or become uh, the application crash on that instance, you're going to lose the state of your running application. So you want to ensure that these things are stateless, that they're persisting their state uh, either in a data store or in some other uh, caching layer and that you can then start to replicate out your servers uh, to provision as much capacity as you need. So providing this sort of stateless environment uh, safeguards you away from the fact that an instance uh, might fail, but it also allows you to start adding redundancy into each of your, into your application tier. So should one of your uh, instances become unavailable, obviously you've got no single point of failure. You can start to, uh, you can uh, lose a single instance, and because you've got redundancy across the application tier, uh, your application will remain available. And of course, because we have utility, uh, elastic uh, provisioning, uh, you can basically just uh, spin up a replacement as easily as anything else. And because you can respond to that programmatically, it means that you're not going to get woken up when you're on pager duty uh, or when things do start to go wrong. So this stateless decoupled approach is very, very important, and housing your application servers in this logical manner across these uh, horizontal tiers is a very powerful approach to delivering high availability applications. Beyond that, uh, you can also spread your, spread your application instances across what we call availability zones. So availability zones are uh, one or more data centers which are redundantly powered, redundantly connected, uh, they're all the rest of it. And so you can start to uh, mitigate not only for individual server or hardware failure, but you can mitigate against entire uh, data center failure by spreading out your applications across uh, these availability zones. And these availability zones are on separate floodplains and fault lines and all the rest of it. So that sort of takes care of uh, removing the single points of failure by adding additional layers of redundancy uh, into your application tier and allowing you to be able to recover from these failures very, very quickly. Uh, but we also talked about this application wanting to be scalable, so the top right there. So let's take a quick look at that. So there's a number of approaches that you can employ here. Uh, one is uh, vertical scaling. Uh, because you're provisioned on an elastic infrastructure, uh, you can basically increase the hardware resources that your application servers are running against. Because you basically have uh, a machine image which you can redeploy on different hardware, you've decoupled your application from the, from the hardware that it's running on, and so you can start to scale up. We call it vertical scaling. You can start to scale up your application tiers by throwing more CPU, uh, more uh, memory, more metal at the problem, basically. And you can do this in a scalable way. So you can increase uh, the amount of uh, uh, CPU or memory resources available to your application or your database or anything else uh, as and when you need additional capacity. And then you can scale back down uh, as and when you need to. So that's one of the advantages running on this utility uh, environment where we have a number of uh, different uh, instance types, physical hardware that you can run against. So that's one approach. The other approach uh, that a lot of customers use is, is what's called horizontal scaling. 
So again, because we've got this decoupled stateless architecture, which originally we put in place to uh, maintain availability and reduce uh, single points of failure, uh, what we actually get for free, if you like, uh, is additional scale. So the dirty secret of scale is really that um, most customers have a pretty good idea of their operational limits uh, when they start working on things. But this approach lets you uh, have your cake and eat it, basically. You can provision an architect for high availability, which everybody needs. You don't want your application to be down uh, at any point, but you basically get scale for free. So you can do this by basically adding additional uh, instances, adding, adding additional resources uh, into the application tier. So you can add additional instances, and remember this is an elastic environment, so that can go as basically as wide as you want, uh, as and when you need additional capacity. And this is a very good way, and you can use a mixture of vertical scaling and horizontal scaling in order to find the right cost point for your application. It may be that a large number of small servers, if you're running a simple service, uh, is, is much more effective uh, than running uh, a small number of large servers, for example. But you get the choice of where to balance that, so it's a nice flexible approach. So you get to scale up uh, when you start to, uh, start to receive a bit, of, uh, a bit of attention, and when you're on the front page of, of TechCrunch and winning, winning your startup competitions, you can provision those additional servers uh, uh, extremely quickly to be able to respond to that. Conversely, with this approach, you can also scale down your architecture. And because we have utility metered billing, as soon as you start to scale down or decommission your architecture, uh, this could be, for example, uh, at night when nobody's using your application. Uh, it could be uh, that you need to scale up for a, uh, to support a particular event or to support a particular uh, period in time, as we have to do at Amazon, to support the Christmas rush. Um, but when those peak times aren't there, so at night uh, and the rest of the year, you can scale down your infrastructure. And because we have this utility metered billing, you stop paying for your infrastructure as soon as you, as soon as you start, uh, as soon as you decommission it. So by removing that infrastructure, you stop paying for it, and you can find significant cost savings there. So we've got, uh, as I say, we're talking about sophisticated applications here. Uh, one aspect of this sophistication is really that we can drive an automated uh, environment here. And we have some services to help you with this automatic scaling. Uh, imaginatively enough, it's called auto-scaling, the auto-scaling service. And uh, we're very bare bones at Amazon. We, you know, we just uh, call things what they are. So we have an auto-scaling service which will allow you to set the operational thresholds on your servers. And the way it works is like this. So you basically specify a launch configuration. This is basically telling the auto-scaling service what to do when it launches a new instance. So which virtual machine uh, to apply to which particular size of instance and how to deploy those and any other configuration details that you might need. It then deploys those into what we call an auto-scaling group and manages the metrics across that auto-scaling group. So auto-scaling is plugged into the CloudWatch monitoring service to pull in uh, the CPU and all the other metrics. And so we can pull in uh, network, disk I.O. Uh, we can pull in any custom metrics that you might want to track, so page load time, database query time. And we can start to use those to drive our application architecture in an elastic way. So we can collect these metrics. Uh, they're available free to any instance that you're running on the Amazon, on the Amazon platform. Uh, you can increase the resolution by paying a small addition to the hourly charge. It's five minutes for free or, or one minute resolution. And you can set what we call CloudWatch alarms. So these are the operational limits of running your architecture. So they may be the amount of IOPS that your application is currently supporting or the page load time. And you can start to set these operational thresholds and, and monitor those. When your application architecture starts to move outside those operational thresholds, so when page load time starts to increase, because you're seeing an increase in demand, uh, then you can trigger auto-scaling policies. And these auto-scaling policies can add or remove architecture from your environment. And because we have this stateless decoupled system, it's perfectly safe to do that. So uh, this will do this, uh, the auto-scaling service will do this within bounds. Uh, so auto-scaling is not gonna go off and provision a million new servers and leave you with a big bill at the end of the month. Uh, you set the operational bounds that you wanna work with, and then the auto-scaling service will, will work within those. This is what it looks like if you're working with the, uh, with the AWS tools on the command line. Uh, so you can create a launch configuration here. You, uh, you give it a name, web launch config in this case. You give it the image ID, as I said, and the instance type that you want to, that you want to launch on. Uh, you can also give it security groups and other configuration names. Once you've created this launch configuration, this is the, uh, this is the cookie cutter for building out or adding instances into, uh, into your wider uh, uh, auto-scaling group. You can create your new auto-scaling group. Uh, these are empty by default. And uh, the auto-scaling service will provision instances inside that to reach your operational thresholds. So you can set which availability zones you want to run the instances across uh, for maximum availability. You say the launch configuration, the template that you want to provision the instances against. 
You set a minimum and a maximum size. These are the operational bounds. Auto scanning won't move outside those operational bounds. And uh, the auto scanning service will work along with the CloudWatch metrics service uh, to register and deregister these instances with the elastic load balancing service. Um, you can also set the minimum and the maximum size uh, to be the same. So if you set them to both be 20, for example, the auto scaling service will ensure that there's all, so always 20 instances running inside the auto scaling group. So you can build self healing systems that automatically recover from failure in that way. Finally, you put the auto scaling policy uh, against the auto scaling group. Uh, so we've got a scale up policy here where we're going to make a, an adjustment of 10% in changing capacity. And then there's a cooldown that you can give to the auto scaling service, uh, which will mean that it will not be re-triggered within, in this case, 300 seconds. So you can make sure that you provision the architecture and you're responding to that capacity before these policies fire again. And these are usually deployed in pairs, one to scale up, but also one to scale down. And this means that when you start to see a decrease in your capacity or an improvement in performance in your, in your operational metrics, uh, you can start to scale down your infrastructure when you no longer need it and you stop paying for it at that point. So now we have uh, our load balancer, we have our application servers, we have our auto scaling service, and we have our DynamoDB tables, and all of that was provisioned along the lines of the cloud formation template uh, that I just used. So again, I'm going to cross my fingers and uh, dive back into the uh, cloud formation template. So here's the, uh, the cloud formation tab uh, that we talked about before. I'm just gonna click refresh here, and we can see that the uh, status has changed from uh, creation uh, into the fact that it has created. And if we dive into this in a bit more detail, we can click on the, the stack, the CloudFormation stack that I provisioned, and we can jump in and see the resources that have been provisioned on our behalf. So again, these are the infrastructure building blocks which CloudFormation has provisioned. So you can see we've got a, a CloudFormation user, so I've created a new identity and access management user, so this is nice and secure. This isn't using my master account credentials just to, in order to be able to mediate access into an S3 bucket. Uh, we have uh, the load balancer that's been provisioned uh, here. Uh, we have a weight handle. Uh, this is a cloud formation technique which will ensure that the application is fully spun up and uh, it will wait uh, to mark the stack as completed until the application has been provisioned. Uh, the security groups to run the application service in, the launch configuration that I mentioned, uh, the web server group, and a, a, another weight condition there. So all of this provisioned along these best practices and connected up uh, using this, this template. Whoops, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so the other thing that CloudFormation does is it can specify outputs. And so what I've done here is I've told CloudFormation to pull out uh, the URL of the Elastic Load Balancer uh, so that we can take a look to see if our application is running. So all I have to do is click up here and we can see that we have a fresh instance of our likability app running live on AWS. And I can go ahead and try and share something. Uh, this will upload an image uh, into, into Amazon S3 and it'll register all the metadata for the image into the DynamoDB tables that we created. So I'm gonna go ahead and upload one of my favorite things, uh, cupcakes from Magnolia Bakery. Here we go. Uh, we're gonna share something. This is gonna do the upload. Commit the upload uh, to S3. And there are my favorite cupcakes. Uh, uploaded, running on the Amazon Cloud. The metadata again written to DynamoDB. All provisioned uh, with, as you saw, just a couple of clicks and provisioned in, I guess, less than five or 10 minutes. Uh, we have a, a like button down here. Uh, we have tags that people can browse and we can just click like and you can see the speed of DynamoDB there. Uh, it's literally the page refresh time uh, before uh, we start seeing the likes improve. And you can see we're recording the views and also the likes there. And we'll be generating some thumbnails. I'll talk to you about how that works in just a second. So that's the application running live. Uh, there's one other thing that I wanted to show you. I have a video for this. Uh, and that is how to register the load balancer information against a particular domain name. Uh, so we have a service for this. Uh, the load balancer will give you a C name uh, back in response. Uh, but we have a service called Route 53, uh, which is already playing, my apologies. Go back. No, go back, pause, there we go. Uh, so we have a service called uh, Route 53, which will, uh, is basically an on, on demand, elastic uh, uh, DNS service. And it's also tied into some of our, our elastic services, such as the elastic load balancer. And that means that we can map our elastic load balancer directly to uh, the root apex of our domain name. So I can show this happening here. So we're back in the root 53 console here. Uh, I've specified the, uh, the, um, the hosted zone, uh, which is the likability.me uh, URL. Uh, from there, uh, oh, I'm sorry. There we go. So we can go to the record sets to adjust those. Uh, you can see that I can uh, look at the record sets. We have the, the bare bones uh, for, the, for the URL there. I can simply specify uh, the C name uh, for, my, uh, for, my, um, uh, dynamic, for my elastic load balancer. And that's it, it's all hooked up. So we don't have to uh, directly map uh, the URL, or sorry, the IP address of our elastic load balancer or anything like that. 
uh, we can simply register the C name uh, at the root apex, and uh, root 53 knows to talk to that to direct traffic uh, in the right way. It'll direct traffic, the elastic load balancer, to uh, instances that have the lowest number of uh, operational metrics, so that are, are less used. It'll also do round robin direction across uh, availability zones, and it'll also do latency-based delivery. So if you have applications running across the various different geographic regions, uh, you can route all of that through uh, Route 53, and that will take into account the latency of the request to push out the, uh, the, uh, the request to the lowest latency region, uh, depending on the source of origin. Uh, this is the demo, just again, that, that we saw before. So what we set up now is a production stack with our load balancer, which is tied into our auto-scaling service, which is our monitoring and scaling dynamically our elastic uh, infrastructure and our applications here. But you can see here that we, uh, we can still have a, a data store problem, right? So we still have potentially a single point of failure in the data store. Databases are relatively challenging to scale. Uh, and the problem with that is that, uh, particularly with relational databases, the performance starts to decrease at scale. So the more uh, queries that you're throwing at your relational database, the more, uh, the more data you've got in that database, or the complexity of the queries that you're running across that database, uh, you see a significant degradation in performance as that scale increases. The problem with this is that your application typically requires a predictable, consistent performance. Uh, so this dotted line on my sort of business school 101 graph here of performance against scale is what your application uh, is designed for and what your application requires to deliver on this fast, uh, high availability uh, uh, roadmap that we set out on our whiteboard. The problem is that with uh, relational databases, as scale starts to increase, you see this sort of degradation in performance. And it gets worse and worse and worse as highlighted by this sort of big pink blob. But this big pink blob represents really a multitude of sins. Uh, it represents a whole load of work that you have to do in order to manage that relational data, in order to be able to manage that relational database. You have to start thinking about data sharding and data caching. Uh, you have to start thinking about provisioning new hardware if you're not yet running up on the Amazon cloud. You have to think about managing clusters and m splitting your data across instances for high availability and for scale, and then how to manage that in a fault-tolerant way. And none of this really has very much to do at all with the applications that you want to build. This very much falls under this undifferentiated heavy lifting that I'm talking about. None of these really provide any differentiating value to your business. They're just the cost of getting your application out the door and scaling it up as more customers want to make use of it. And where we see these particularly thorny technical challenges at Amazon, this is where we want to innovate on behalf of our customers. And so uh, we have a service which we rolled out a couple of months ago uh, called DynamoDB. You've already seen me provision a table and how quickly that happens. But DynamoDB is a fully managed NoSQL database service that is designed uh, to provide this consistently fast performance and predictable performance that your applications desire. So it's designed with low latency in mind, so you can expect single digit latencies on uh, your queries and on your, your writes and your reads. Uh, so less than five milliseconds for reads and less than about 10 milliseconds for writes. And as I say, all of that is possible because we're backing this on solid state disk. So all of the DynamoDB data is stored on SSDs uh, up on the Amazon cloud. And we use that to provide this, uh, this very low latency access. It also provides seamless scalability. Uh, so there are no table size limits. You can put as much data as you want into DynamoDB and it'll handle it. It's got unlimited storage and it'll handle the live repartitioning of the data under the hood so you don't have to worry too much about that. Its goal really is to provide all of this the speed, the persistent performance, uh, really without any administration. So there's no need to go in and manage a distributed uh, fault-tolerant application architecture just to handle your, your data store. This is really point and click just as you saw. So when I click create table and I went through the, what was it, three or four clicks to provision that, DynamoDB will handle all of the provisioning of the, of the infrastructure under the hood, of the storage under the hood, and able to be able to uh, put my data in and get it out. It's designed to be as obviously durable and available. Uh, so DynamoDB has consistent uh, disk only writes. Uh, so one way that you can work with these uh, relational databases at scale is to put a cache in front of them. But then you have to worry about cache misses and uh, uh, availability of the cache and all those sort of things. Uh, it's not ideal. With DynamoDB, we only acknowledge that a write has been completed uh, in that very low latency time frame uh, once it's actually hit a disk and when it's copied across multiple data centers. And then we'll copy across uh, multiple availability, availability zones uh, asynchronously from there. And as I say, this predictable performance is, uh, is very important and it's delivered on DynamoDB with an uh, approach that we call provision throughput. So provision throughput uh, allows you to basically reserve the amount of I.O. that your application needs. 
So you can set this per table, as you saw when I spanned this up originally. Uh, this was set up at creation, uh, but you can also scale it at any time uh, via the API. Um, and if, critically, you can do that without any downtime. So DynamoDB will stay available as it's scaling itself under the hood, as you're twiddling the dial to provision additional throughput, additional read and write I.O. So let's take a look at what, what this actually looks like. Uh, so here we can see uh, just what it takes to uh, increase uh, the provision throughput of an instance. Uh, I just go in, I click modify uh, table, uh, I increase the amount of uh, read and write units, uh, and I click OK, and we're done. And what DynamoDB is doing under the hood is provisioning additional, uh, uh, additional uh, disk, additional infrastructure in order to be able to deliver on your reserve. And you can do that uh, programmatically or, as you can see, uh, live here. And as soon as you click update, uh, that will go to active and the update has been complete. So what this means is that you can be running uh, this, uh, this is, uh, you can be running at a particular level of provision throughput and suddenly when you need additional scale, you can start to scale up. So this is, uh, this is a graph that I collected from uh, our CloudWatch monitoring service. Uh, this represents the, uh, the number of read units that the DynamoDB service is, is currently consuming. And as you can probably guess, uh, this little red arrow, that's the point at which I turned up uh, the provision throughput. That's when I started to drive more traffic to the likability application to, in order to test its scale. In order to do that, I was able to additionally provision uh, the infrastructure. So I could scale that up uh, uh, very, very quickly. And you can see the, the response to that as scale started to increase. Conversely, uh, when scale started to decrease, uh, at this point, uh, we can see the amount of read units being uh, consumed each minute or each five minute interval. And you can see that starting to decrease. And this is the point where you can start to think about decommissioning some of that provision throughput. And as soon as you start doing that, uh, you stop paying for it. So it's still got that elastic, flexible nature that you're used to in running an elastic infrastructure, uh, but it's all done under the hood on your behalf. And this is a really interesting graph. So this is uh, the amount of CPU utilization used across my auto scaling group. So here I drove what I think I simulated about 10,000 concurrent users and drove it at my application for about 30 minutes. Uh, you can see the CPU utilization spiking up there, uh, going up through the roof, uh, but you can also see the get latency. So here in the green line at the bottom, uh, the pretty much flat line, this is the latency of the reads that DynamoDB is showing. So even as I'm driving this massive increase, uh, immediate increase in scale, the DynamoDB latency uh, actually doesn't increase. In fact, in this graph, you can actually see that it remains remarkably level uh, inside, the, inside the period when I'm driving a lot more traffic at the web application. So that's CPU utilization going through the roof and DynamoDB not even breaking a sweat. So let's take a quick look at how you can take advantage of this flexible uh, NoSQL data model. Uh, this is slightly a slight change from the relational model that some of you might be using. So I just wanted to cover it in a, in a, in a, in a very higher order way. Um, basically, rather, as I said earlier, rather than DynamoDB having a, a schema, having a required set of, uh, of, 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 of columns, of rows, and all the rest of it, uh, you can basically specify any key value pairs. Uh, we call them attribute pairs in DynamoDB. And these are basically a bag of key, keys and values that you can assign to what we call an item. Uh, so you can think of this as an associative array or a hash or anything like that. It's simply a key and a value. And you can have very sparse data structures supported in DynamoDB. So not all, each individual item within your DynamoDB table can have very, very different keys and values. Uh, so you can add metadata and additional information uh, as and when you need to, uh, but not have that taking up space, not have that wasting. So you can have these very sparse data structures. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, the only piece of information that DynamoDB does need uh, is a primary key. And here, this is a unique key that uniquely identifies uh, the, the, the collection, the hash, the bag of keys and values uh, that you're going to retrieve. So here, we specified a primary key of an ID. Uh, we just have one key there. Um, you can also use composite keys. Uh, so the primary key is the only way to retrieve information from a DynamoDB table uh, when it's running live on DynamoDB. In order to extend that, to make it a little bit more flexible, we also support what we call composite keys. And this uh, allows you to specify a hash and then a secondary composite range key. And that looks a bit like this. So in our tagging table, this is the data structure that we're using. Each item, each tag, uh, has a primary key, uh, which is uh, the tag name, in this case, cupcakes, and an item uh, for which is the unique identifier of the photo and all the other metadata. And this allows us to uh, basically retrieve, for example, all of the items that are tagged with, uh, with, in this case, cupcakes. So you can do more complicated queries. And this would also be a good way of retrieving, for example, if you had an order 
uh, for an e-commerce site, you could retrieve all of the orders for a particular customer in a date range and things like that. So it's a, a relatively flexible way uh, of, of, of providing more query flexibility uh, in DynamoDB. So the best practice when working with DynamoDB is to produce well-balanced, fine-grained hash keys. So good uh, primary keys for DynamoDB are things like customers, orders, and items. These are relatively discrete and basically easy to distribute across the, uh, the distributed hash of DynamoDB. Bad, um, bad primary keys would be things like game ID or store ID uh, that would drive a lot of traffic to a particular point in, in DynamoDB. That point, you're going to start to lose some of the benefits of this distributed zero administration predictable performance model. So one of the things I really like about DynamoDB is that it has a super simple API to so the whole likability application, uh, including all the tagging and all the workflow and all the, uh, the image uh, manipulation and everything else, is less than 200 lines long. Uh, so we see on DynamoDB, you don't connect up to it as a standard, uh, as you might a relational database. There's no connection pool to manage. Uh, you just make simple puts and gets uh, against the database. So here we can just uh, create a new item by putting our bag, our hash of values into DynamoDB. So this makes it very, very productive when you're working through development and test and your data model is evolving. Uh, but it also means that you can evolve that data model as your business needs change. So you can start to add, remove keys without having to go through the hassle of migrating schemas and all those sort of things. It also supports atomic update. Uh, so this is very useful uh, and we use this to drive the, the likes feature or the views feature. This allows you to make atomic changes uh, to, uh, to, to attributes inside DynamoDB. So if you've got uh, 100,000 uh, customers all liking the thing at the same time, uh, you get an atomic uh, addition of those rather than all of them uh, being applied uh, just once. So atomic updates, uh, done, DynamoDB, you get all of that for free, and that's how we do the likes and the page views. So that sort of introduces DynamoDB in our typical three-tier web application, but I just want to spend a few minutes talking about how some of the additional services we used uh, in, order to be able to out, in order to be able to build out more automation and to build out greater flexibility down the line, so sophisticated services. So one of the things that is inside likability uh, is an image processing pipeline. Uh, this uh, basically uh, works a little bit like this. Uh, so when a customer or a user makes a, a new share against their, against their photo, uh, we basically run it through a series of, of series of steps. So this is an image processing pipeline, but this could easily be a business process. This could easily be a collection of synchronous and asynchronous or long-running tasks. So some of the things we do is we obviously upload that image to S3. We want to get that into the durable storage of S3 as quickly as possible. We want to create thumbnails. Uh, so we create a tiny little thumbnail. Uh, we, which we use uh, for a preview, but also a slightly larger thumbnail that which, we, which we use and deliver to the mobile application where we want to still conserve bandwidth but provide a slightly higher resolution image from the very high resolution images that uh, the customers might upload. We then might want to do some duplicate detection, uh, so to take a look to see if customers are uploading identical items. And uh, Amazon has a great service for this called Mechanical Turk. It allows you to present information to real people. Uh, and this is perfect for tasks which people do well uh, but uh, computers typically do very badly. So categorization, duplicate detection, and all the rest of it. So in this case, we could throw up to Mechanical Turk a large collection of people that are, are willing to go through and add metadata to, info, to information, basically, and ask them to detect the duplicates, to show them two images and say, are these two the same things? And you can either do that for free or pay them a little bit for their time. Finally, we want to run some statistics and some reporting and build out a, a top 100 list, so the most viewed and the most liked uh, images in our application. So um, obviously we've got duplicate detection, which is going to be long running, which is going to go out to real people and could, can potentially take a large amount of time. Uh, we've got an update, some statistics and some reporting, which very large data sets may take a, a long time as well. Uh, but we also have things that we want to happen uh, immediately, like uploading the image. So the problem here is that we just can't do this inside the event loop. We can't do this inside the, the request response loop in the browser, because as soon as we get to these long running asynchronous tasks, you know, what are we going to do? We can't get the, brow the person on the other end of the line to wait until we run through the rest of our business process in order to return them a result. So we return the result as quickly as we can, and then basically continue to run this uh, workflow outside of the event loop. And one of the ways that we can do that, or the sort of typical way of designing this in a, in a, in a, in a service-oriented architecture, is to turn these into services. Uh, so to have a thumbnail service that we can make requests against, which will take the image and generate the thumbnails for us. Uh, which are a duplicate service, which will take the image and again, queue up the tasks on Mechanical Turk, uh, the reporting or a stat service as well. And the way that this is typically orchestrated is using message queues. 
Uh, so as soon as we've uploaded the image to S3, rather than generating the thumbnails in line, we may put and add a message to a message queue, and the thumbnail service will simply poll that message queue in order to be able to collect the information that it needs. As soon as it's, uh, as soon as it's got a new image, generated the thumbnails, it'll enqueue a, a next image in the next step. So the duplicate service, once that's done, it'll enqueue it. And you can imagine these film forming quite, uh, quite complicated uh, 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 trees with dependencies and ordering and all the rest of it. Uh, but that's typically the way that it's, it's done. One of the benefits here is that you can scale these services independently. So you can add additional capacity to each of the services when you want to, build out high availability services and, and pretty much run them wherever you want because the orchestration happens through these message queues. The problem with this approach is that orchestration is really hard with complex business processes. If you start building a tangled web where part of your business logic is, is encoded in your orchestration logic, some of your, uh, some of your uh, uh, dependency tree is encoded in there, ordering becomes difficult, so you want to ensure that one thing happens after the next. You don't want to have duplication of tasks, particularly tasks which are expensive to run, such as Mechanical Turk tasks or looking up in an external service that you might have to pay for. And you have to manage all of the metadata associated with this as well. So there's a lot, again, of undifferentiated heavy lifting here. There's a lot of work that customers have to do just in order to be able to build out these service-oriented architectures. So again, where we see this level of, uh, this he level of heavy lifting, uh, we like to innovate on behalf of those customers. And so uh, about a month ago now, we uh, launched Simple Workflow. Uh, so Simple Workflow is an orchestration service which basically allows you to handle all of these in a managed way. So this is the way it works. So you have a uh, simple workflow running up on the Amazon cloud. Again, you don't have to provision uh, any of the, uh, the infrastructure to handle this. It's a managed service. Uh, you can basically get to focus on the business critical aspects of your workflow. So you can run your, uh, your workers uh, up or perhaps on the Amazon cloud. So these are the services which are actually going to uh, implement uh, the image resizing service or, or anything else. Uh, you can push asynchronous or manual tasks uh, to particular individuals through mobile or, or uh, other interfaces. And you can run some of this on existing infrastructure as well. So anything, any service, any mobile device, uh, that, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud, that has visibility into the Simple Workflow API can take advantage of these orchestration features. So that means that you can mix and match uh, on-premise uh, uh, services with services that you might be running in the cloud. And uh, you get to uh, encapsulate your business logic into something that we call a decider. So a decider can be written in any language, uh, and it basically takes a look at the running state of the application, of the, of the workflow, and decides what to do next. So you can build out uh, a complex business logic and encapsulate it in the right place, which is in your own code, and they can be written in any language that you want. Then the workers uh, on the mobile devices, on-prem, wherever else, get to poll the AWS uh, simple workflow service. They pull down tasks that are waiting for them to, to be to be processed, and the decider also polls uh, the simple workflow service and gets the running state of the application and basically gets to say, right, well, if that's the running state for this particular task, in that case, do this next. And it can do that at pretty much any scale in a managed environment. Uh, so I thought you might like to see uh, this actually running uh, in process. Uh, so um, this is uh, two terminals, super exciting, I know. On the left-hand side, uh, I think we have, uh, we have the, uh, the activity. So this is one of the workers that's running on the Amazon cloud. Uh, this is gonna do the image resizing for us. And on the right-hand side, we have the decider. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna play through what happens when somebody submits a request uh, to, to the likability web application. Uh, so here we go. On the left-hand side, uh, in the decider, is this playing? Hang on a sec. Uh, go. Awesome. So there on the right-hand side, you see the decider receive the task that something's gonna happen. On the left-hand side, you can see the activity, you can see it resizing the images, and then the decider gets told that this image resize is completed, and it basically wraps up and completes the task. So you can see that that was very quick. Uh, you can see that, it was, uh, that this is happening across multiple instances, and you can basically put these uh, wherever you want. So that's uh, the, a worker and the decider running live, polling the information from Simple Workflow. Another advantage of this service-oriented approach uh, is one of flexibility. We talked about that being an important aspect of sophistication. And what's really good about these workflows is that you can version them. Uh, so you can work against different versions. And so, for example, uh, if Amazon were to introduce a, a search service, such as we did uh, last week, uh, you could easily integrate that into your workflow. So you could provision and deploy a new version of your workflow pipeline, uh, which not only updated the tables, did the duplicate detection, but also updated the search index in the search in, the, in cloud search. 
So uh, you can see how flexible this is. You can continue to evolve. You can add and build out complex dependencies between these tasks. Which brings us nicely to stats and trends. Uh, we implemented that as a service uh, in our workflow. So after the duplicate detection or in parallel with duplicate detection, uh, we might want to do some statistics or some reporting against the data uh, that we're housing in our DynamoDB table. Uh, so this is really common. Uh, you typically want to get some insight. You want to be able to evaluate customer behavior, but also you might want to be able to take some of those statistics and pass those back and build them out as part of your, uh, part of your application, such as the most viewed and the most liked uh, items or photos or, or whatever in your application. So for this, a uh, really common service uh, is called uh, Hadoop. Uh, this is an open source Apache project. Um, it basically allows you to distribute your task uh, across multiple instances. Uh, so this is an implementation of the popular MapReduce framework, which allows you to basically run distributed computation uh, at any scale. It scales really, really well, but it's kind of time consuming in order to be able to manage a Hadoop cluster. Again, you have to deal with failures and scaling and all the rest of it. And uh, again, where we see these sort of uh, point pain points on our customers, uh, we like to innovate. And so uh, about 18 months ago, we uh, launched uh, Elastic MapReduce. So this is a managed uh, Hadoop service which allows you to really focus in on the queries, the questions that you want to ask of your data, of your customers, uh, of your behavior of your customers, or any other data source, and be able to ask questions of it pretty much at any scale. So this is uh, you know, uh, used for very, very large sort of financial services, uh, but I'm going to show you how you can use it at, at, at pretty much any scale. So Elastic MapReduce integrates really nicely with DynamoDB. Uh, it can read and, uh, data from DynamoDB, pull it into the distributed cluster, and then allow you to uh, uh, ask much more flexible queries of your data. So in DynamoDB, because uh, of its, because uh, of the distributed hash nature, as I said, we only have uh, primary keys and, and, uh, and composite keys to access our data. Um, with Elastic MapReduce, we can open that up and expose that data to what we call hive queries. Uh, you can use it for backup and restore. Uh, but you can also run these flexible queries against your data. So Hive queries look a lot like SQL. It was designed this way. And if anybody's ever written any SQL, you should recognize this. And this is the query that we're running using Elastic MapReduce to talk to the data live in DynamoDB in order to be able to pull out uh, a list of, uh, of items in our tab DynamoDB table ordered by the uh, amount of views that they've had. We've got a similar one for likes. So we can do this with live data in DynamoDB. We can also Cross those, uh, we can span those queries across live data in DynamoDB, but also in uh, data which may be archived into S3. So we can create these, uh, these external virtual tables of our data and query across them using DynamoDB, uh, using, sorry, Elastic MapReduce. So the goal here, as I've been keep saying, is to really remove this undifferentiated heavy lifting of providing these sophisticated services. And we're going to continue to, to drive forward in identifying pain points. Uh, everything we do at Amazon is really driven by our customer feedback. Uh, so uh, by all means, if you've got anything that uh, is causing you pain, uh, please come and talk to uh, myself or anybody else in an, uh, in an Amazon jersey uh, and tell us uh, what's causing you pain, and we'll be able to take that on board and use that information in our product roadmap going forwards. If you've got specific deep technical architecture questions that you want to ask, we've also got a Q&A session uh, with some of our solution architects. They're a fantastic resource. Uh, so uh, in the room next door to this, uh, just go out of the room, turn right, and then right again. Uh, you'll see a little handwritten sign that says Q&A. Uh, by all means, uh, go in there, ask our solution architecture team if you've got any specific burning architecture problems. So with that, I just want to wrap up in the last couple of minutes with just a really brief overview of security in the cloud. So security really underpins everything that we do at AWS. And so I wanted to give you a, a, a sense of uh, where the responsibilities lie when it comes to securing these architectures. So uh, we have a pretty global footprint these days. Uh, we have a number of different what we call regions. And regions house uh, our services. You can think of them basically as individual mini clouds. Uh, so we have uh, regions, uh, the yellow circles over on the left-hand side uh, in, uh, in the West Coast. We've got one here in, uh, on the East Coast. Uh, we're opened up in, uh, in Sao Paulo, uh, in Europe, and also Singapore and Tokyo uh, in Asia-Pacific region as well. And in addition to that, we have a growing number of uh, points of presence for our content delivery network, which are the little blue guys. 
So these regions contain multiple availability zones, uh, which uh, a lot of these services like DynamoDB and S3 use to build out high availability, uh, uh, durable services for your data. Uh, S3, for example, uh, is tolerant to two simultaneous points of failure and it achieves 11 nines of data durability. And it does that by splitting out across availability zones and you can take advantage of those availability zones in building out your architecture uh, uh, on EC2 as well. So you can design for durability and a lot of our services uh, do that under the hood like DynamoDB and S3. Importantly, data stays local. Uh, so whilst we might mirror data across these availability zones for, uh, for durability, we won't move data uh, between regions. Uh, so you can do that yourself if you want to, but there's often good compliance reason why you wouldn't want to. And so data always stays local and you retain ownership and access control of that data. But ultimately, we operate a shared responsibility model. And this is probably the most important slide that I'm gonna show today. So we share the responsibility of securing uh, the cloud application full stack with our customers. Um, we basically take the responsibility of securing uh, the infrastructure. So everything from the foundations of our data centers all the way up to the hypervisors of our virtual machines, that's on us and we take that responsibility very, very seriously. Beyond that, the operating systems that are running are on those virtual machines, the applications that are running on top of those operating systems, and the data which is housed within those applications, it's up to our customers. It's our customers' responsibility to secure those applications. Uh, so you, it's up to you to decide on the right level of encryption for your data to meet your own needs. Uh, we don't have any visibility into how you're using these services on EC2, uh, so we wouldn't be able to stop you if you're running uh, an open FTP service uh, with your password file. Uh, don't do that, by the way. It's, that's not best practice. But it's your responsibility to ensure that that isn't happening, and it's our responsibility to ensure that the infrastructure is secure. And we can do that uh, with a number of certifications uh, to show how we're approaching this. Uh, so we have service organization controls which uh, certify our, our control objectives around our infrastructure. We're ISO 27001 compliant. We can reach FISMA moderate compliance. And we're also PCI DSS level one compliant for uh, uh, payment processing. And that's a really good example of the shared responsibility model. If you want to reach that with your own application, uh, we, can uh, we can certify the infrastructure, but you have to certify your application on top of that uh, to reach PCI DSS level one at the application level. So that's a shared responsibility model, a very important aspect of securing applications running on the Amazon cloud. Uh, we have a great collection of white papers uh, on our security center. Go to aws.amazon.com slash security. Uh, they are, um, we got one on security, uh, a security overview of our security practices and one on compliance, uh, compliance and risk in the cloud. Uh, I highly recommend you take a look at them if you're deploying on AWS. Um, they are well worth a read. They're written in plain English. They're relatively short. Uh, they're available as, as Kindle eBooks, so you can download them and, uh, and uh, read them on your daily commute. So in summary, just to wrap up, uh, I want to talk about some of the things we've talked about. So we touched on designing for failure and the importance of building out redundancy in your application. We talked about using uh, decoupling uh, to build stateless architectures uh, that can respond at horizontal scale. You can use auto-scaling to automate that response to add additional uh, capacity when you need it and shrink that capacity down when you don't need to. We talked about DynamoDB and offering up this uh, high performance, consistent performance uh, running on SSDs. We talked about using simple workflow to build out uh, these sort of sophisticated asynchronous processing pipelines and uh, encapsulating your business logic in the right way. We talked about Elastic MapReduce and using that to drive uh, analytics and additional insight into your data. And we also touched on the availability of uh, Cloud Search, uh, which is also extremely easy to use uh, in just a couple of steps. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much uh, for your attention, and I hope to see you all at our summit here tomorrow. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Matt. You want to do Q&A now or yes. later? All righty. Any questions, anybody? We have one uh, there. Yes, gentlemen. We need a control for the DNS server, <coughs> and also uh, to uh, do to do that, I think also we need the the fully dedicated IP address. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually spoke to was <laughs> very fortunate to speak to to a few uh, senior engineers. <coughs> was confirmed that's possible. 
But afterwards, when I have really technical issues, they couldn't answer. <coughs> One uh, person didn't fail to answer. Uh, when I asked other question, he answered very quickly. Another one who is working for Loop 53, I think that's the group directly working on that issues. Hmm? But he couldn't uh, answer the question. He said, you know, he's probably better off to ask, you know, the ES, uh, EC2 group. And also, very interesting, you know, because I have this opportunity, you know, now. So before I came here, I also asked the group, which does the uh, IP reverse mapping. I think that group is also very directly working on this issue. But <laughs> the person uh, who at first said that he didn't understand the question, and then the rep who, uh, who you know, the person who rep, you know, he said that he could answer my, he could understand my questions. Yeah, so it, it sounds like you have, uh, you have a sort of specific technical yes, question around the platform. That's, uh, so it's, it's a very important issue because if we cannot have control of our DNS servers, a lot of applications just won't work. Right, so I'm not sure I totally understand uh, uh, your, your specifics. Uh, but by all means, come and talk to me uh, offline, and I'll be able to introduce you to, to our solution architecture team uh, to, to, to help work through some of this in a bit more detail. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, so if I were uh, to ask you, what's your current minimum investment, the minimum platform that you can, I'm sorry, thank you. Uh, what's your minimum cost monthly to, to be able to provide a scalable architecture? Obviously, load balancer, at least one micro EC2 instance, and a scalable database. Sure. So um, it's, it's very much application specific. Right, so um, you know, the, there are some minimum requirements to deliver a high availability architecture. Uh, that is to have um, um, instances across availability zones running your application tier uh, and have some sort of load balancer in front of them. Uh, so there are cost effective ways of, of delivering that. Uh, you mentioned micro instances, uh, which are a very low cost, uh, but relatively uh, resource constrained instance type. Uh, but it really depends on your, on your application. So, one of the advantages of running on the AWS cloud is that you get to decide the cost performance balance for your application. So you get to weigh up exactly where you want to spend, uh, spend uh, architect infrastructure resources uh, within your architecture. So maybe that will be running on DynamoDB, maybe that will be running on uh, the relational database service, maybe that will be running uh, purely against S3. You can drive a lot of static content uh, just from S3 and static pages just from S3, for example. So there's a lot of best practices in, uh, in, in delivering that. The other critical thing is to take advantage of these, uh, these different pricing options. Uh, so we have uh, what we call on-demand resources. Uh, so that's the price that you pay for, uh, for resources. If you just jump up, log on to our website, and start provisioning and start using them. Uh, but if you know that you have resources that are going to run for a particular length of time, uh, either low, medium, or high utilization, uh, then you can make a small upfront uh, um, commitment uh, to run that. And that allows us to plan uh, more efficiently in our own data centers. And uh, because we're sort of committed to pass those efficiencies onto our customers, uh, there's a, a lower hourly rate of running those instances. Uh, so finding out the level of utilization for each uh, component of your architecture allows you to make the judgment call of whether you want to, which sort of utilization reservation you might need to make. And then, of course, we have the spot instances as well. And we do have some customers that run entirely on spot. That's not necessarily uh, uh, recommended. And you do have to architect for the fact that interruption can occur. Uh, but uh, there's, a, there's a very effective way of pulling in very, very low cost resources where you get to decide the level of price that you want to, you want to take advantage of. So really understanding those, those different uh, pricing models will help you get a better idea. If you've got a specific architecture in mind, by all means come and talk to us and we'll be able to, to point you in the right direction and give you some guidance on, on, the, on your specifics. You're welcome. Yes, sir. You've got time for one. This is the last one. Make it a good one. architecture to, to use the auto scale, uh, the elastic beam cloud? Uh, again, I'd have to know more about your specific, uh, your specific point, but uh, absolutely, right? I mean, there, there are uh, a lot of applications which can take advantage of elasticity, uh, but the first steps are very much in providing a decoupled architecture, in providing stateless servers and all the rest of it. But 
there is uh, another migration path for, for uh, applications which have a larger legacy, uh, which maybe weren't uh, designed with architecture in mind. And uh, there's, a, there's a sort of phased approach that you can take in terms of uh, moving those over or migrating them onto the AWS cloud. And again, we'd love to talk to you about that in more detail offline. No, actually, it's designed with decoupled architecture. It's mm -hmm. stateless. It's all that. Perfect. But You're good to the go. The servers that, are d that we have uh, provisioned, we didn't do the auto scaling yet. Ah, I see. Right. You want to so retrofit auto scaling. Right. On, on an existing instance. Yeah. And so that is possible, uh, but we don't have time to go into the details of right. how, it, how it's done right now. But come and find me afterwards. I'll, I'll talk you through how to do it. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thanks a lot, everybody. I think we're ready for our next speaker. Paul? Thanks a lot, Matt. Awesome job.